Committee will come to order. Good morning, and thank you all for being here. Today's hearing will address the issue of equal access to restroom facilities. This is not a minor issue. I'm certain that every woman in this room has frequently experienced the inconvenience as well as the discomfort caused by an insufficient number of women's restroom facilities. Women are often forced to wait in long lines to use public restrooms or walk further to find a restroom while men rarely have the same problem. The lack of restroom facilities for women has a number of causes. Many public buildings, including universities, airports, theaters, offices, and factories, were built decades ago before women had entered the workforce in large numbers. Moreover, the, these buildings were designed and built at a time when contractors, architects, engineers, builders, and government procurement officials were overwhelmingly male and rarely considered the needs of women. To be honest about it, while women have made a lot of progress, those professions are still dominated by men, and old habits die hard. Public restroom facilities for women have still not caught up to those for men. Throughout history, public restrooms have been the site of institutional discrimination by race, fiscal ability, and gender. With laws such as the Civil Rights Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act, we have made great strides in dealing with the race and disability discrimination. However, we have not done as well with gender discrimination. Today, women still like equal access to restrooms in many places of employment, education, and recreation. The fact that many federal buildings do not provide as many restroom facilities for women as they do for men is simply unfair. It is time for that to change. Within the last couple of decades, public appreciation of gender parity issues has gradually resulted in improvements in restroom gender parity. As of 2006, at least 21 states had adopted statutes addressing restroom gender parity. That's good, but we need to take the next step. That's why I introduced H.R. 4869, the Restroom Gender Act, with my colleague, uh, Congressman Issa from the great state of California. The bill requires that all new federal buildings, as well as major renovations of existing federal buildings, have at least an equal number of restroom facilities for men and women. The passage of this bill would be a milestone in the path towards true gender parity. I'm proud to say that I introduced the bill with the support of the ranking member and several members of this committee. Uh, Mr. Issa, who was an original co-sponsor, H.R. 4869, will ensure that from now on, federal buildings will be constructed with equal access to restroom facilities regardless of gender. This hearing is the next step towards enacting this important legislation. I look forward to hearing the testimony of today's witnesses. I will now yield five minutes to our ranking member, the gentleman from California, Congressman Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for so much for your leadership on this important issue. As people seldom realize in Congress, in order to move a piece of legislation, we hold hearings. In order to understand the final and best form of that legislation, we hold hearings. I think this is no exception. Your leadership, by drafting a piece of legislation, that attempts to create equal access is not only laudable, but it's essential. As we view the legislation and with your leadership, I hope that we can gain the most important part of the intent of this legislation. That is that we get a one-to-one -one ratio in access. In preparation for this hearing, I've reviewed a number of documents and discover, for example, the Department of Defense facilities those that are co-ed, require not one-to-one -one because there's only about 17 percent women today in the military versus, uh, you know, 83 percent for women, or for men. 
So the ratio there would be different. But I believe your leadership is essential because that ratio is changing. So to find equal access there will be a different and ever-changing requirement. There is no need to build equal amounts of men's and women's rooms in, uh, in the Pentagon today. But that is changing. We need to plan. We need to ensure that the architects designing new facilities design them based on the assumption that someday there will be roughly the same amount of men and women potentially, or even in some cases more women than men. Additionally, through your leadership on this issue, we've, gone, we've been reminded that a same number of facilities is not the same number of access. As members of Congress, we're periodically invited to the Kennedy Center. Kennedy Center events typically tend to be equal men and equal women. Anyone who has ever been to a black tie event held at the Kennedy Center is well aware that there is a line at the men's room, but it pales in comparison to the one that wraps halfway around the building at the ladies' rooms. The Kennedy Center enjoys equal number of facilities for men and women. Equal in this case is not equal access. So I join with the chairman in his leadership in recognizing that by the time this bill becomes law, it has to create a mandate for equal access, for flexibility in design, so that the buildings of tomorrow and retrofitted buildings of today recognize that a longer line for one and a shorter line for the other, no matter which way it works, is inappropriate in our design. Federal buildings should lead in that, in that endeavor. The GSA and other organizations responsible need to begin upon uh, this notice and hopefully begin in earnest upon enactment to realize that we want architectural plans to be a model for the rest of the world in providing one-to-one -one ratio of access based on not only what the ratios are today, but planning for ratios that may change over time. Mr. Chairman, I want to personally thank you for your leadership. This is an area in which this committee is taking a leadership position that I believe no other committee has even begun to look at, and our oversight over federal facilities and the federal workforce makes us ideally suited to shepherd this legislation. I thank the chairman and yield back. Right. You know, I'd like to thank the gentleman from California for his uh, very kind statement. Uh, I now yield three minutes to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Congresswoman Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate this hearing, but it, it really says something that we have to hold a hearing on what really should be an administrative matter. Uh, my friends on the other side of the aisle and, and um, us over here have a lot to disagree about, but I hope that uh, gender par parity when it comes to uh, men and women who equally have to go to the bathroom is not one of them. The reason this has become an issue, of course, uh, has been precisely because some facilities were designed as if uh, there were only men in the world, much less men who had to attend to their needs. Uh, my friend, uh, the ranking member, who uh, mentions that the line is longer uh, for women, you'll notice that we said it should equal or exceed. Uh, but the reason I perhaps could inform him in, in a way that he could not be expected to know uh, in part is uh, that uh, women spend longer in there and they're not always just attending to their wants, sir. Uh, when we go in, we have to uh, attend to our looks as well. So you will see some people standing in line who don't have to go to the bathroom at all, but they want to see how they look. All we want to make sure is that those who do want to attend to their needs are able to do so uh, equally with men who have the same needs. And the last time I heard, men and women really do have the same needs in this one sphere. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield three minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you all for holding this hearing. I think it's a very important hearing. We've seen the lines at sporting events, airports, museums. Women are usually standing in extraordinary lines waiting to use the restroom. It is a phenomenon that we have come to accept that there will always be a wait for the women's facilities. This type of gender discrimination should not exist. In a time when we have a female Secretary of State, female Speaker of the House, 
two female associate justices and one on the way, uh, it escapes me as to why women are treated as second-class citizens. Restrooms are among the few remaining sex-segregated spaces in the American landscape, and they remain among the more tangible relics of gender discrimination. It often goes unnoticed and is considered normal, natural, or acceptable. Buildings have not kept pace with the changing demographics of the past half century, when more women than ever are, have entered the workplace uh, than ever before. However, as members of Congress, we need not look far to see this discrimination. Just across the street at the Capitol building was an example of restroom gender inequality. According to the Journal of Planning Literature, female members of the United States House of Representatives would have to walk down a long hallway, turn left, then turn right, into a small windowless bathroom with only three stalls. By contrast, men walked only a few feet away from the House floor. Since then, ladies' restrooms have been added to the first floor of the House, and most recently in 2000 had three additional stalls added. And according to uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, uh, Norton, that's, far, that's definitely not enough. In the early 1990s, in the Senate, Nancy Katzenbaum and my colleague from Maryland, Barbara Mikulski, were not allowed to use the senator's only restroom, which in fact was a male-only restroom. They had to trek downstairs and stand in long lines with the tourists. Senator, Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell announced that he was uh, having women's restrooms installed just outside the Senate chamber to accommodate the growing number of female senators. And then in, in, in the 110th Congress, uh, Mr. Chairman, I join you all in co-sponsoring the Restroom Gender uh, Parity Act uh, for federal buildings, and I join you again, and I do so gladly. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, submit the rest of my statement for the record, and with that, I yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman from Maryland for his statement, and of course, um, um, now we will turn to um, our first panel of witnesses. Um, uh, United States Representative Steve Cohen from the state of Tennessee, the 9th District, and United States Representative Yvette Clark, the 11th District of New York. You know, it is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. And so will you please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right. May be seated. Let the record reflect that both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Let me begin by saying I ask the witnesses to summarize their testimony in five minutes. You know the rules about the lights. I don't have to explain that to you. Uh, you are very familiar with them. You know, in fact, you turn them on and off. Uh, the yellow light means you have a minute left, and the red light means stop, of course, and, uh, and then, of course, we will have time to uh, ask questions. Um, so um, why don't I start with you first, Representative Clark, and then uh, we'll go to um, Congressman Cohen. Congresswoman Yvette Clark from Brooklyn, New York. Thank you very much, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, for inviting me to speak before the committee this morning. I'm here in support of H.R. 8969, the Restroom Gender Parity in Federal Buildings Act. This bill, which was introduced by Chairman Towns and with Ranking Member Issa, Representative Visklosky, and myself as original co-sponsors, requires the federal acquisition regulation be revised to require the number of toilets in women's restrooms equal or exceed the number of toilets and urinals in men's restrooms in all future federal buildings or major renovations of existing federal buildings. Once passed, this legislation will align the federal government with the, gender, uh, the restroom gender parity laws that are already on the books of several states and municipalities, including Virginia, Texas, Pennsylvania, California, and New York. As a former New York City Councilwoman, I introduced the restroom, women's restroom equity bill, which created a two to one ratio of women's restrooms to men's restrooms. My bill became city law in 2005. Previously, New York City had required a one to one ratio for women's restrooms to men's restrooms. Restroom parity refers to equity of access to public restrooms by all users. Though the issue of inadequate accommodations may seem trivial to some, 
restroom gender parity is an issue that impacts a woman's health as well as her quality of life. Research underscores the potential health implications for women waiting in long restroom lines. These include abdominal pain, increased risk of cystasis, urinary tract infections, bladder infections, all of which can cause renal damage if not adequately treated. Pregnant women and older women suffering from incontinence are particularly impacted due to their need to visit the facilities more frequently than others. To avoid using inadequate restroom facilities, women oftentimes forego eating or drinking and will often hold it, which poses problems. Inadequate restrooms are more likely to affect women because they often have small children, may be breastfeeding, have feminine hygiene needs, and usually have to wait in a long line. According to Sarah A. Moore's 2002 Virginia Law Review article, Facility Hostility, Sex Discrimination and Women's Restrooms in the Workplace, gender discrimination in restrooms can be found where restrooms are unequal between men and women, when they are inadequate for women's needs, or are missing completely. Moore's article aptly pointed out that unequal women's restrooms may be found in many professional places of an employment, including our nation's capital. A congresswoman in the United States Capitol must plan her trips to the restroom properly, or she may miss a vote, and I can attest to that. Public restrooms have historically manifested many forms of discrimination. For example, restrooms used to be racially segregated and inaccessible to the disabled. Restrooms in airports where wealthier travels go, travelers go are much nicer than in bus stations. Gender discrimination is yet another form of restroom inequity. According to a recent J GAO report, most federal government buildings were constructed on average over 46 years ago. At that time, women were not in the workforce in the large numbers that they are today. More importantly, issues of gender e equality were a non-issue when many of the federal government buildings were designed and built primarily because women were not empowered to the extent that they are now. That was then, this is now. Now is the time to correct the oversights of yesterday by addressing the restroom gender parity issue. I ask that my colleagues on this committee join me in improving the health and lives of women by supporting the passage of H.R. 4869, the Restroom Gender Parity in Federal Buildings Act. Chairman Towns, you are to be commended for acknowledging this inequity that has existed in our civil society for far too long. Let me thank you for your courage of conviction in bringing this long-standing issue to light and moving closer to addressing this inequity for women and their families. And I yield back the remaining of my time. Thank Th you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, and let me thank you for your statement. Also, thank you for the work that you've done on this issue. And, of course, we look forward to continuing to work with you on it. Now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Towns, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, I want to thank you for allowing me to testify on this important legislation. It's also an honor to sit next to Congresswoman Clark, who is a member of the great class of 06 and has worked on this issue in New York, and to testify in the presence of the photograph of the great Chairman John Conyers. As author of the Tennessee Women's Restroom Equity Act, I'm pleased to address this issue here in Congress, and I'm pleased it's being addressed. Uh, the Council of State Governments has a model act passed in the 90s on this issue. And so that is available, and the Council of State Government saw it as an issue that all 50 states should be made aware of that at least 15 years ago. About half the states have passed some sort of restroom parity law by now, as well as municipalities, and the federal government needs to catch up. Normally we're a leader, but in this case Brandeis' as opportunities for the states to be laboratories of democracy have also made us laboratories for the federal government to learn, not just the other states. Mr. Chairman, a lot of times people, when I dealt with this bill many years ago, called it potty parity. They made jokes. But the fact is, it's not a joke. And not only is it not a joke to women, it's not a joke to men who go with women and have to wait while they are standing in line, but it's also politically very popular. It's the right thing to do, and it's catching up with the cultural lag in our society. We've seen long lines of women's restrooms when men have none, and that's gone on for years. It's just uh, simply a fact that on average women take longer. Uh, Congresswoman 
Clark mentioned some, some needs, feminine hygiene, that, to be honest, didn't hit my mind immediately, but that's certainly an issue, and babies' needs. And there's a little more quality now with dealing with children, but the women have oftentimes been the primary uh, caretaker and taken women in the restroom with them as well. Uh, there's many studies, including one at the University of Washington that's extensive on the, the ratio that should be required and the needs for this. And the fact is, thankfully, more women care about their appearance than men do, and so there is more time, and I'm thankful that occurs. Uh, there are also stalls, there's the removing of clothing, and when men remove their clothing, you got to hang your coat up, and, and that takes more time too. Uh, so there's many reasons for the extensive time, the additional time, and the need for more equity and proper accommodations for women. I first recognized this need in Tennessee when I was at the Starwood Amphitheater at a concert. The woman's line was just went on forever, and the men's line wasn't very long. In fact, there were women jumping in the men's line and joining in the men's restroom. A lot of beer was served at that concert. Uh, it, it wasn't fair, and I realized, you know, those women were in distress, and as well as being a little inebriated. Uh, I noticed it, and also I had to wait for my friend in line and thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? I just hung out there around the, the restroom, not necessarily a place you want to hang during a concert. So it's an inconvenience to males as well as females, but to us it's secondary. It, it wasn't conscious discrimination, but like so many other things, like institutional racism, sometimes it's there without people knowing it. It just happened over the years and, and, and been perpetuated. And this is somewhat institutional racial dis, uh, gender discrimination. Uh, these facilities were generally designed by architects who were predominantly men, and engineers constructed them, and again, they were mostly men. It didn't seem like an issue to them, and they didn't have any concerns in the federal buildings, and at that time, most federal employees were men, and there was discrimination as well. Today, we've reversed a lot of that history, but still we have restrooms being built without restroom equity being taken into consideration. It's not just about convenience, there are health consequences. Abdominal pain, cystitis, and urinary tract infections can occur. So we, we need access, and we need to, to step up. And Chairman Towns, you're to be commended for doing this and, and, and ranking member ISA. Sometimes for men, it's not quite as easy an issue. It wasn't as easy as women also. I tried to get Speaker DeBerry to be my sponsor the first time, and she got such ridicule, she dropped off. I got another woman to be the sponsor, she got ridicule. Finally, we, we got a sponsor. But it was difficult for women sometimes to take on the issue as well as men. But it's an issue that's important for both genders. Uh, as you consider this legislation, I would hope that you, uh, some of the experience we had in Tennessee well, could be taken advantage of. That's flexibility and discretion are needed. We had a two to one ratio, and that was, I think, the right ratio. But we found out that sports events, and it covered sports arenas, and the Tennessee Titans, originally Adelphia Coliseum, now called uh, LP Field, the upper deck had many, many more men who were getting inebriated, and they needed more men's restrooms. And so we went back and changed the law and allowed the uh, a board to determine the proper ratio so it could take into consideration those places like, as Chairman Issa mentioned, the Department of Defense, where there might be uh, more of a likelihood that you'd have a need for more men's facilities. But at men's football games on Sunday, you need more men's restrooms in the upper deck in Adelphia. We found that out. Uh, this applies to federal buildings, and I think that it's uh, so important that it be passed and passed in a proper fashion. Mr. Chairman, you've made great strides in, in and we've made great strides in this country in, in reducing gender discrimination. We did a little bit better, and we've done other laws such as this. But we need to work in this area, and I appreciate you and, and Ranking Member Issa for bringing forth the legislation. I'm proud to be a co-sponsor, and I'm willing to help in any way I can to see that it becomes law. It's needed in America. It's in 2010. It's been needed before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me thank both of you for your um, uh, statement, and let me begin by um, – uh, saying um, to you, um, Ms. Clark, and to Representative Cohen, you know, uh, how and why did you get involved in this issue? Mr. Chairman, I got involved in this issue because I realized um, during the holidays what distress women really are under. It's not just the stress of having to prepare for the holidays and being out in the public. It's maneuvering with children. I looked at the way that commerce was being impacted. I saw women who had to wait in line for the restroom and then have to wait online for a checkout counter. And I saw people just sort of throw their hands up and say, I'm not even going to deal with it today. I realized that there were adverse consequences. And I realized that over time, we had actually been training young girls uh, and women to hold it. Uh, it has just become a part of our conditioning and behavior that was totally unnecessary. 
And so we looked at this in the city of New York in particular, uh, where we are always in a very crowded situations and realized that there was something we could do about it. That in the development of our building codes, we could create the conditions under which we could create a restroom equity. And so I moved forward with my colleagues in the city of New York and we made it happen. So I believe it's possible that we can do this at the federal level and it will be a, a major leap forward so that young girls coming up today will not be conditioned in the way that I was to have to hold it every time we are in an environment where the line is so long um, and, and, and risk impairing our health. So thank you very much for asking that question, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I could probably uh, just say similar to what, what uh, Representative Clark said. I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we passed our Tennessee bill in 1994. So it was, it was at the Starwood Amphitheater when I noticed this extraordinary line and just the, 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 the unbecoming and, but, but necessary conduct of some women jumping into the men's line and going into the men's room. And I just thought, you know, there's something happening here and it's not necessarily good. I think that's some song I'm paraphrasing. But, uh, the, you know, I saw it at, at all kind of facilities. And uh, it, was, it was just in, in, indicative of, of a history of lack of attention uh, by apparently, you know, male-oriented architects and engineers. Not intentional, but just a, a pattern and a history not thinking about it. And then I, what I did, to be honest, I used the women's lines after I would be in line and I'd be out and my, my date would still be in line or whatever. I'd use the women's line as a focus group. And I would ask them, what would you think about a law to do this? And believe me, every one of them was real big in favor. And I told them, right, I found out who their reps were and who their senators were and told them to call them. We passed our bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Um, um, you know, my experience was that uh, we were at a play. And, of course, uh, I went to the men's room, came back. And then the second act is getting ready to start. And I'm still looking for my wife. And, and she's nowhere to be found. And so finally, you know, I'm getting really you know, agitated with the fact that the second act is going to start. You know, when it gets dark in there, you can't find your seat. You know, I mean, of course, um, and then finally when she showed up and I said, well, where were you? She says, I was in the line. You should have seen that line. Uh, she said it was all around the wall. I mean, people everywhere. And then about three weeks later, I was in an airport in Florida and I saw this long line, you know, and then, of course, being from New York, I thought they were giving away something. You know, and uh, you know, I wanted to make certain that I got some of it, whatever they were giving away. And so, uh, and then I looked, and I realized there's only women in the line. And then I looked, and then they were going to the bathroom. And I said, gee, this is ridiculous. Something needs to be done. And that's what precipitated me to get involved. And I talked to my uh, ranking member who, uh, I must admit, I also spoke to his wife you know, uh, about it as well. And of course, he's now committed to being helpful. And I want you to know I appreciate that, you know, very, very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. On this note, I yield now to the ranking member for any questions that he might have. Well, I think after you talked to Gwen and I talked to Kathy, there shouldn't be too many questions. <laughs> uh, with both of you having done different laws in different states, uh, let me try to focus on the base uh, legislation versus where we should go from here. Rep. Clark, uh, Ms. Clark, you did a mandate of two to one in New York. Was that based on a study? That's correct, Ms. That's correct. Actually, it, there is a provision in the federal building code that calls for a two to one ratio, and that's what we followed. Okay. Uh, well, you know, we, when checking on this, that federal ratio, oddly enough, didn't count urinals. So uh, the GSA uh, setup is basically one to one if you count urinals, two to one if you don't count urinals. So it's, it's a little ambiguous and it's one of the, the things we hope to resolve. Uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, your, uh, your legislation uh, had to be modified based on an observation that no fixed ratio necessarily solved the problem. Is that correct? Mr. I, so that's, that's, that's accurate because we had the two to one ratio and I think it was the University of Washington. There are like two universities that had scholars that had done a lot of research 
and and I believe that was one of them. And and that's we, we took the two to one, and it worked in most facilities, but it didn't work at the at the Titan Stadium. And I went up to the Titan Stadium. I climbed up there and I looked and I saw and they didn't have enough facilities and and. Uh, it was just a need to change it. So we did change it and we gave some discretion to the State Building Commission. But I would suggest if you give discretion that you require that they give a reason, maybe set a standard and then require them to give a reason why they deviated from that standard and give some, some rational basis uh, to require them to, to do some type of study and, and explain their decision. Right. Well, well, H.R. 40, 4869 currently is a one-to-one -one ratio and requires GSA, which of course doesn't control DOD, which is a separate challenge for us, uh, to, uh, uh, to have these various reasons. Current law on purchase prey, cur current law when GSA builds or purchases a building is a one-to-one -one ratio. Current law when, or current practice in September of 2000 when GSA leases, is they do an assessment based on the anticipated ratio of men to women in the building. Now, I would assume that for both of you, uh, that flexibility of analyzing the, ra the current ratio and adjusting it if the ratio changes periodically would be a good part of the base bill. Uh, you know, an all men's prison don't put in equal amount of men's and women's rooms, I assume, would be good judgment. I would agree. Um, we just want to keep into account visitors which tend to be women and their children that may accompany them because women oftentimes take their children as well as correction officers where the ranks of corrections are becoming more and more uh, women involved as well so those would be some okay. of the considerations and I think you're hitting the nail right on the head there you, you have those kinds of ratios to consider uh, let me let me ask sort of a uh, an additional question our, our current legislation doesn't call for a new study based on certain criteria. Would such criteria, and I'd like your input after the hearing too, as to anticipated age of the people who are going to be in a building, you mentioned that, uh, obviously the gender ratio, the attire, uh, I think Ms. Norton sort of made it pretty clear that at the Kennedy Center, women may be needing to do more that, that would cause them to be even longer. Well. At a baseball game, you, you know, you're, we're all in shorts and we're just going in and out. It may be much quicker. Those and other items, do you believe that we should include in our legislation sort of the analysis so that we get it right the first time and what the legislation doesn't currently envision is a flexibility uh, of design for future ratio changes? Are all those elements that based on your two experiences in legislation, we should include in ours? You know, Chair, Mr. Ice, I, I agree that you need to include those things, but there's no question that no matter where you go, it, there, there's, there's, two, there's two types of business. And when you go in and you're a man, you don't have to take off any clothing. And it can be done, and you're in and you're out, and you don't do lipstick, and you don't do anything, and you're out. Women, there's You're a not a Californian, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> in Tennessee, you don't. <laughs> and in... Uh, and, and women have always got to remove clothing. And no matter where it is, whether it's coats or whatever, it's going to take more time. And so I, I wouldn't give in almost any business, any museum, any, any, any government building, there, there needs to be in those, I'd, I'd say, a two-to-one ratio. But well, and, and this is what, what I'm getting to, is our current leg base legislation was dropped as a one-to-one -one, uh, to correct, if you will, the past tendency to have less than one-to-one, -one, even though the current GSA guidelines were one-to-one. -one. And what I'm hearing today, and, and the chairman's leadership on this uh, obviously is crucial, is that we need to, one, find out if two to one is the right ratio, find out when it's the right ratio, make sure our legislation adjusts for total occupancy, including visitors, uh, and then we have to have sufficient flexibility for the fact that we don't want to build twice as many women's rooms in a building that currently has nobody, but we need to be able to adjust as that changes in federal buildings that will last at least an average of 46 years. Is that pretty much what you're coming to us with? Because, and, and Chairman's being indulgent with the, the time, but very quickly, can you tell me if we're looking at a 100-year building and we're in a 1962 building, is that what we need to make sure we get right here uh, so that we not be arbitrary, but also so that we get it right for equal access? I would say those are some of the considerations. Uh, the one thing that you probably, we probably all cannot anticipate is the length of stay for 
individuals within the restroom facility. Everyone's trying to rush out, yes. But as we've stated, women have um, extraordinary circumstances that, uh, that oftentimes men don't have. Uh, we are always carrying handbags with us. They're, they're always extra things that, that just aren't part of the, of the male uh, um, exercise each and every day. Uh, women, on the other hand, have those significant challenges. And then you're talking about uh, women of varying ages. And, and so all of those factors would have to be taken into consideration in, a, in an environment where we know that there are going to be a lot of people traveling through. A place like this, for instance, is a place where we know that there are going to be visitors in addition to those who work here uh, that are going to call for uh, that type of ratio to be closely examined. And I think that you have uh, come up with a number of the significant variables. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the gentleman is raising some very interesting questions because when you look at the overall picture, so I think that one thing that we might be able to do to sort of help out a little bit would be able to put changing boards into the men's bathroom so that the men could be able to do some changing of the, of, the, of, of, of the babies as well because they're not in our bathrooms. So I think that might be one thing to sort of help and to be able to eliminate. We're the both line. in the grandparent age. We're getting away <laughs> with a lot by saying the next generation should have these changing rooms. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland for his question. Mr. Chairman, I'll be uh, very brief. First of all, I want to thank you all for your testimony. It's been extremely helpful. This uh, legislation, uh, similar legislation, uh, was uh, didn't get very far last time. Um, and I think we need to approach this, as our chairman has, with the, with the urgency of now. Um, so that we can make it happen. Um, and we will certainly work with you all to try to make that happen. And that's why I was so glad, Mr. Chairman, that you held this hearing today. And so now we have to move it along and, and get, uh, get it through the House and get our Senate colleagues to uh, act with some type of urgency. Because, you know, as you've laid it out, it is an urgent situation. And we can mess around and mess around, and we'll be making these same discussions, having these same discussions 10 years from now. And so many women would have been deprived for so long. And so with that, I want to just thank you. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, very thank you, gentleman from Maryland. I yield to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C. No questions, Mr. Chairman. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I am going to share with you my opening statement because I don't have a question. And I want to indicate how our nation's capital is really slow in responding to this. Uh, restroom parity was brought to the national stage in 1974 when my good friend, uh, California Secretary of State, March Fong Yu, smashed a toilet bowl on the steps of our state capital to protest paid toilets in the state. And I was in the California State Senate when we passed the first restroom parity bill, the California Restroom Equality Act, introduced by then Senator Art Torres in 1987. His wife had taken several children uh, to the Coliseum in Los Angeles, and you know, at halftime, they ran out. The kids had been waiting all through the game, and they ran out to go to the restroom, and the line was like around the stadium. So she took them to the men's restroom. Yes, they were in and out. So she took her children uh, that she had with her to the men's restroom and then took this legislation to her husband, and you know it got passed. And California understood then that many public buildings had insufficient uh, facilities for women because of outdated notions of the prevalence of women in the workplace. And since then, many states and municipalities have adopted a similar statutes, but today's bill would be the first federal legislation to address restroom parity. Now, we're 3,000 miles on the other side of the country. And we are just now getting our state capital to realize this is a human basic need and we need to correct it. So throughout our history, public restrooms have been the site of discrimination based on race, 
gender, and physical ability. Uh, in the Old South, people had to, if you look like me, you had to go to the back room, which was usually uh, really a place that was filthy most of the time, uncared for, unkempt, and you were dressed in your Sunday go-to-meeting clothes, and you had to go to the colored restroom. So the Civil Rights Act in 1964 eliminated this form of discrimination based on rest, uh, race. Just as in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act required reasonable access for disabled people to such facilities. So with today's uh, legislation, we have the opportunity to finally address gender discrimination in federal facilities by requiring that one-to-one -one ratio for any federal building constructed for public use and by mandating that preference be given to buildings that meet this ratio when leasing new federal buildings. So I just want to thank uh, our author and co-author and for bringing this late, not you, but this country has been late. You see, we were always on the cutting edge, edge in California. So thank you for catching up with us. Good luck. We should pass it out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the gentleman from California for her uh, comments. And of course, uh, we were trying hard to catch up. And no <laughs> doubt about it. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Congressman Cuellar. Any questions you might have? All right, no questions. No other questions from the committee? Well, let me thank both of you for your testimony and look forward to working with you in terms of making this a reality. I think the time has come. You've made the case. And of course, we need to do something about it. And I want to congratulate you on what you've done in New York. I want to congratulate you on what you've done in, in Tennessee. So uh, we look forward, as uh, Congressman Watson said, catching up. And that's what we hope to be able to do. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is second pound. Like so third. Second panel to come forward. Uh